Okay, there it is. Recording has started. Well, again, once again, welcome everybody. A very good morning. Welcome to our very interesting and in this new times, a uh, very, very pertinent and relevant talk this morning on navigating academia, hubs and mentors to help us to publish so that we don't perish. With us here today, we have Associate Professor Dr. Raja Rizal Azman bin Raja Aman. So there he is. <laughs> so Dr. Uh, Raja Rizal, or Prof. Rizal, is from the Department of Biomedical Imaging at the Faculty of Medicine. And he is a both a lecturer and also a clinician. He's a radiologist at UMMC, our UM Medical Center as well as UMSC, and he does work on neuroimaging as well as cardiovascular imaging. So he can look into your brain and he can look into your heart, so be careful. <laughs> and of course, uh, apart from his clinical work, um, Prof. Rizal is of course also teaching and doing research and publishing at the Faculty of Medicine. But in addition to that, he also has a very, very deep interest in mentoring. So he's starting out now with developing programs to mentor undergraduates at the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, but hopefully, inshallah, God willing, he'll be able to expand that into postgrads. And today, he's actually going to be sharing some thoughts about mentoring and creating hubs and collaboration among us academics so that we can succeed in publishing and hopefully succeed in our academic lives as well. So we're looking forward to that very much. Um, we will be having this talk for about half an hour or so. Definitely you have questions. If you do, just hold on. And at the end of it, we will be having a question and answer session. And you can either type your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand if you are not familiar with MS Teams at the bottom bar of uh, the screen or at the top bar of the screen, you will find there is a raise hand function and we will try and get to your questions. Um, hopefully you can get to everybody and have an interactive session today. So with that, without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over the screen to Prof Rizal. Over to you, Prof. Thank you so much, Amira, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm just going to share my, my slides now. Let's see if that happens. Um, this and this. All right. Is that, can you guys see that? I'll just check. We can see that. Yes, we can see it now. And we can also see your uh, desktop. Basically everything on your screen. And now your slide is up there uh, by itself. So that looks okay, good. Okay, cool. So that, that works, yeah? Okay, great. So that, thank you so much, Amira, for that for a wonderful introduction. I'd like to thank ADEC as well for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. Without really knowing what I'm going to speak about, I totally appreciate the faith they, they've put in me. But what I'm going to talk about today is about collaboration. Hopefully, I want to impress upon uh, you guys how important it is. I think we already know it's important but how kind of doable it is and how it can help you progress on what you do, make things a bit easier as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges to collaboration, why it's so difficult. And then particularly for the more junior academics in the, in the audience, some practical aspects of what to do really to help you um, increase your reach really to collaborate easier with, with other people. Um, and I hope, uh, I hope you guys find it interesting. Okay, so off I go. So this is my, my first slide, and these are really pretty porcelain elephants, okay? They're called Kakimon porcelain elephants, and they live currently in the British Museum in the UK. Now, when I saw them, I thought, oh, I don't know, they're quite pretty, and they're about the size of, of a little dog, and I would have thought they're from India or China, but they're not, they're from Japan. Now, around this time, the 17th century, China was kind of like the base of porcelain making and all of Europe wanted all of China's porcelain because it's so beautiful and nobody really thought of Japan. But through some wars, Japan acquired this craft for making porcelain. And after the Ming Dynasty fell in about the mid 17th century, Japan rose, uh, began to rise as the porcelain center of this region. Um, so I thought it's a nice uh, illustration about how crafts from China by Japanese craftsmen 
looking at elephants that don't even exist in Japan or China can produce something so beautiful and something that persists till today. So this is like a collaboration in the 17th century that produced something so, so beautiful. So not only was it beautiful, but it's also very profitable. So the trade in the ceramics, so because Japan was closed off the rest of the world in the mid 17th century, only the Dutch East India Company was allowed to trade with Japan. And they made a lot of money trading all this porcelain to Europe. And they made these porcelain things really quite famous as well. Okay, so that's my example of how incredible collaboration is and how far back collaboration stretches as well. Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. We constantly hear it, don't we? So this is stuff from the UM strategic plans. So we've got collaboration there, collaboration there. VC's recent talk mentioned collaboration as well. Then multiple documents from Mosti and the Kementerian Pengajian Tinggi also constantly mention collaboration. So we know we got to do this thing called collaboration, but we don't totally know how, how to do it or sometimes even why, why are we collaborating again? So I'm going to borrow a slide from Prof Ng. So Prof Ng is one of the physicists in my department and he's kind of like my mentor. Okay, so Prof Ng says, Prof Ng says, we can do things kind of individually, okay, and that's okay, and we can only get so far. And then we instinctively want to do things when projects become quite large, we do things kind of like in an additive measure, you know, so you write this part, you build that wall, I'll build the roof, whatever. And then once it's all ready, we'll get together and maybe we got a house or a research project or whatever. But the real thing that we need to kind of like level up to is to try and communicate with each other to create, if you like, kind of like new disciplines and new answers. And this is the, the only way to solving very, very complex problems, okay? If we want complex solutions to complex problems, we have to kind of have this interdisciplinary approach. We kind of have to talk to each other, share what we do, share problems and share solutions as well, okay? So if you want to create impactful solutions, impactful research that changes things around your own department, your own university, your own community, you got to work together, you got to collaborate, okay? So just in the past few months, these are examples of incredible collaboration. So the top two pictures is about the landing of the Perseverance rover on Mars. Amazing, right? It was so cool. And even this idea of sending a rocket into space yeah, it, to, to land on a foreign planet is already an incredible collaboration between the US military, um, theoretical physics and engineers to try and get that rocket to the moon initially. Uh, but now to Mars. And when they get there, they need scientists as well, chemical, um, we need chemists, we need geologists to try and understand, we need biologists to try and understand what is it we're dealing with in Mars. So an incredible uh, collaboration producing incredible results. The vaccines that we've created, that's the bo bottom um, image over the past one year. So it's totally unprecedented having vaccines created just within a year of a disease being, being discovered basically is, is absolutely incredible. So the pharmacologists and the chemists, of course, did an amazing uh, job by coming up with the vaccine over one year. But to further that, so I just had my vaccine yesterday and UMMC is vaccinating something like uh, 400 people a day. They're aiming to vaccinate the entire hospital within three weeks. Eventually, we plan to vaccinate the entire country within a year and a half, something like that. And the entire world, maybe within five years. So this is an incredible effort at mass vaccination. And it's not just the doctors and the pharmacologists that, that, that need to work on this. We also need logistics. These vaccines require, you know, minus 80 um, refrigeration to transport and deliver these things. So you're talking about a huge infrastructure of incredibly skilled people addressing complex problems. And if you look around you, these are the solutions. So if we as you fill in the blanks, doctors, chemists, engineers, uh, academics, want to be part of solving these complex problems and want to create things with huge impact, we have to start working together initially in our own university, but with other universities after that to try and find these solutions. All right. Now, everybody knows that, I think. I think that's not, not too complex. But why is it so hard? I find it really, really difficult to, to collaborate. I find it difficult to go around and say, hey, do you want to work with me? What about you? Do you want to work with me? Nobody ever does. So I think the first problem is this thing about transactional mentality. I think the moment you approach anyone for some help, you know, if you're like by the roadside and you say, can I, can, can you spare a moment for the environment? People will usually say, 
what's in it for me? And that's pretty much what I find as well. I mean, it's, so, it's very easy for people to say, you know, you should approach people, get out there, whatever. But this transactional mentality, sometimes on our part as well, makes it really quite difficult. You only approach people or projects of very high value. Now, um, I think the competitive environment that we, we live in, I mean, all academia is, of course, very competitive. But personally, in UM, it's certainly very competitive. We've got KPIs to deal with. We've got to look over our back, see if people are not trying to stab us, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and just trying to survive. So it's a very competitive environment, making this transactional mentality really, really flourish. We've got this hierarchy problem as well. Part of it is, is our own culture, but I think all academia has this problem as well. You know, I'm the prof, you're the junior lecturer, I only like review, you should do all the stats, why haven't you submitted yet? This idea that creates a lot of inequality in teams, making collaboration very, very difficult. The second thing that I find I have to deal with commonly is this idea of silos. Now, we hear it a lot, and I think everyone knows this as well. And we certainly have silos even within our own uh, universities. Um, and a lot of that is, I don't think it's because purely about competition. I don't think it's because, you know, I don't want the computer science department to, to succeed. That's why I don't, I don't go see them. I don't really like the lawyers. I don't think it's that. I think it's more about differences in, in culture, differences in language that makes it difficult for us to approach each other to begin with. But even once we've started to communicate, to really understand the different problems that the different departments and different disciplines face, I think it, it makes it difficult. Culture, language and focus. So it's very real, I think. And I think if we don't think about ways to overcome this, they will always exist and be barriers to working together. All right, this is my point about how sometimes we continuously enforce these rules and we don't realize that these rules undermine our own efforts. So we're trying to collaborate, but at the same time, we also enforce rules, you know, bureaucracy or things that create those obstacles uh, that undermine our own effort. You know, I like that far side um, cartoon because it's like in the line and he doesn't realize it's going to slaughter, but he's saying, you know, we got to follow the rules. You know, what, even if to death, you're going to be behind me. I'm going to be the first one to die. Yeah, that's kind of it's funny to me. I don't know. OK, so practical things now. So this is uh, from one junior academic to another, I, I guess. What can you do? Because when you when you start off, it's so difficult, isn't it? Everything's so competitive and then the goals are so lofty. They're so high. You look around you and, you know, UM wants to be the, the number top 10 university in the world. And it's, it's your job, basically the juniors, to, to win the Nobel Prize multiple times over. And it's very difficult to draw a link between what I do day to day in my little, little room and all these lofty goals, okay? So the first thing I would do, and I wish I could tell myself when I was 10 years ago when I started this, is to, is to just stop competing, okay? And think about your own centrality. Okay, that's my segue into this ridiculous thing about centrality. So this is where I reveal, uh, I give away my age a little bit by talking about all web browsers, okay? So all, uh, all search engines like AltaVista and Yahoo, they worked on this keyword search kind of mechanism, okay? So if you typed in, I don't know, BMW or whatever, you type in BMW, then they would send you or rank the site uh, higher, the, uh, the sites that have more of the keyword will be ranked higher than sites that don't have so much of the keyword. OK, so you end up having these sites from the 90s sites like they just say BMW 300 times. OK, and you end up getting those sites really. These are called like keyword spam sites. OK, and this was a big problem in web search engines for a long time. In the late 90s, a chap called Raymond Lee and Larry Page uh, separately developed um, algorithms. So Raymond Lee developed something called Rank Dex that eventually became Baidu in, in China. And Larry Page developed something called PageRank, which became Google in, in the States from Stanford. And they thought that this idea about keyword search is kind of old. And they like this idea about link analysis. So they started to rank web pages according to, according to linkages. So websites that are more often linked to whatever thing you're searching for will be ranked higher than websites that are not so linked. Okay. So they looked at number of linkages plus quality of linkages. 
So if you were linked many times by the BBC, for example, for the word BMW, BBC keeps looking to you about BMWs, you'd be higher ranked than people that are, you know, cited by sites that are like Malaysia Kini, let's say, lower ranking site to the BBC, okay? So number of linkages and quality of linkages define the centrality of the different web pages. This idea about hubs and centralities begin to emerge because of this problem with the ranking web pages. Okay? Okay. Now, I really like this idea of centrality because the same crazy solution, the same clever solution, was also applied to the analysis of the brain. So this is functional MR, okay? So the image on your left is a regular functional MR where we kind of get the patient to move their finger or whatever, and the different parts of the brain are light up, and we say, oh, that's the motor bit, that's the sensory bit, fine. The image on your right is a resting state MR, where we get the patient to just kind of lie down in the MR and do, do very little, okay? For a long time, we weren't really sure how to analyze this data. We have different parts of the brain lighting up, and we didn't really know how, what to make of it, okay? Now, something called um, functional connectivity analysis was applied to the resting state MR. And they found that they could assign different nodes in the brain and then think about whether some nodes are more central or less central according to different disease conditions. Okay, and they found, for example, differences in connectivity and centrality after carbon monoxide poisoning. And then in multiple sclerosis, patients with cognitive impairment and these patients that have problems with memory or function uh, because of multiple sclerosis have a different kind of connectivity problem uh, shown by this centrality analysis. Words like a uh, hubness, so how central things are begin to emerge. And the idea that the brain is a connectome, that connectedness, connectiveness, connectedness of different parts of the brain uh, really define its function more than individual parts, okay? So I really like this example because it's two separate problems, web page ranking and functional MR analysis, but it's the same solution to two different problems. And they would never have come to this if they didn't cross disciplines, okay? So I think, it, I think it's amazing. How to increase this, this centrality? So this is back to what you can do personally, okay? So the... Um, the uh, the effective habit, Stephen Covey's effective habit of sharpening the saw. I don't know whether you guys know that. The uh, the habits of highly effective in individuals. The seventh habit is sharpening the saw. And Stephen Covey uh, thought about sharpening the saw as in he thought that your body is the instrument to your own success. Okay. So every now and again, you have to sharpen your own tool. You have to you know keep fit, eat well and then strengthen your own muscles or whatever, that, that kind of thing, you know, sharpen the sword is what Stephen Covey said. I want to go a step further and think about if you are the tool, then what attribute within yourself is really your best attribute, if you like? Are you good at writing? Are you good at telling jokes? Are you good at dressing up? Are, you know, are you good at statistics? Uh, are you good at computers? Identify that attribute and develop it, okay? on a daily basis, be proactive about developing that attribute, sharpen that saw. Once that's good, once you've identified and it's amazing, advertise it, okay? Go out, present, call up people, say, you know what, I'm really good at mathematics or I got nice shoes, whatever, okay? Advertise it, tell, tell people. And once you've done that, try and get people to gravitate to you, reach out to people, find others who potentially have complementary skills, yeah? Find people that can add to your own um, skills, make you better at whatever it is you do, dressing up, statistics, or whatever, okay? What can you do as a, what can you do as a, as a group? So as a group, once you've found your little group of human beings, you could potentially create hubs, okay? You can build teams that have complementary skills, okay? and then aim to increase the centrality of that team, okay, by reaching out to people. So by organizing forums, your own little platforms, or attending other forums, showing off what your team does, you know. Now that you're good at this, and you have a friend who's good at this as well, you can build uh, that team slowly. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
you can build that team slowly and then advertise how good that team is at hopefully finding answers to problems. This is an example of some of the forms that exist in the Faculty of, of Medicine. You know, we've got Science Cafe, we've got in the middle here, we've got this research meeting that, that we, we do every week and we invite people from different parts of our own faculty, but we're trying to get people from other faculties as well. And then we have breakfast at uh, Faculty of Medicine where we have different lecturers present different things. And the idea is to kind of cross borders. Within our own faculty is already quite difficult, so we try and get, you know, the uh, the medic the, the clinical people to meet the basic science people the pharmacologists to say hello to the microbiologists um, things like that just to kind of mix mix things up okay if you want to make your own meeting these are some rules to the meetings okay so the first one is to try and avoid this competitive nature you know don't do this thing where you have you know best best presentation this year gets a hamper or whatever be kind of non-judgmental all presentations are fine and then be be you know inclusive across the board as well it doesn't have to be about which receptor on the coronavirus is the most awesome receptor all the time. You know, it can be about the art, you can discuss history, whatever. Just as long as people are, are sharing, you know, and you're kind of inclusive from junior to the most senior person should play a part in it. Get your audience. I think in Malaysia, it's very good to have uh, food before we had all these webinars. If you didn't have food, nobody would ever show up to whatever you're trying to present, okay? No matter how, how how many Nobel Prize winners you can line up in Malaysia, if you don't have, you know, at least curry pop, it's not going to happen. No one's going to come. Focus on engaging your audience and your own faculty, okay? What we want to do is try to encourage scientific curiosity and for people to discuss and criticize and to be open about criticism as well. You want to encourage that and we want to show that it's fun. Scientific curiosity is fun. And it's fun to, to pick at people's presentations and it's fun to present, okay? To take away the stress of people having to, you know, having to present like this. It's supposed to be kind of fun. And if we go back to, to what these things are called, you notice that they call like kind of casual things, aren't they? They call like science cafe. It's not called, you know, the best meeting in the world. They're not called like that. They want to they wanna tone it down. So they say, you know, science cafe. And this one is called breakfast at FOM, even though there's no breakfast there, okay? No one serves food there. You know, but it's called these casual things to try and keep, to try and lure people into like how casual, how relaxed this meeting is. Okay, you should try and aim for that if you want to make one. The final thing is to focus on building relationships. The point of these meetings is to build relationships. Okay, and these are the different relationships that I rely on on a daily basis to deliver everything I do. Some of these individuals are radiographers that acquire the images that, that I report. Some of these are the physicists that run the machines. Uh, some of these are the radiologists that help me report and I constantly, constantly discuss with them almost every single thing that I do. Jointly, they all contribute to almost all research projects that, that we do in the department. And this is kind of how we work and we eat durian and we go out for tose and stuff like that as well. Okay, so build relationships and I want to see, I'm hoping that this can grow to other faculties as well. I'd love to have uh, durian with the faculty of um, computer sciences okay a little bit about mentors uh, before I end so these are my mentors this is prof Ng on, on the on the left and this is prof young so prof Ng is a physicist in my department prof young is a cardiac uh, radiologist and she's currently our, our deputy dean and these are their mentors so this is John Cameron uh, from I think Wisconsin and this is ProBJ, who is my former head of the department, a very well-known uh, radiologist in Malaysia. And my point is that, you know, I've been to many talks uh, like Shara and Pradana or talks where, you know, people get some honorary award from the Neuro Neuro Neuroradiology Society of Malaysia or whatever. And at the end of the talk, no one ever says, uh, and now to end, you know, I've never had a mentor before and I don't think anybody needs mentors. Sekian will be like, Tafik, goodbye. No one says that. Everybody says, I've got, I like to thank all these people in my life and they always put mentors at the top, the people who led them when they were very junior. So we all need mentors, okay? We all need mentors, no matter how amazing you think you are, you're not going to be able to do it alone and you need to be able to work with people at your own level, but you need mentors as well. And by extrapolation, you need people to mentor as well. You need those mentees as well, once you reach a certain level. And the point I'm trying to make is that it doesn't happen organically all the time. Sometimes you have to be proactive about that process, okay? 
So there's been lots and lots of studies about mentoring in, in the States and in, in Europe. And it's certainly something that's amazing. It contributes to anyone's career, fine. I think we kind of knew that even before they, they came up with studies. The thing I'm interested in is who doesn't get mentored, okay? So there are people that are left behind. And in America, it's the minority groups. If you're not white or male, you are under mentored, okay? And the way to think about that in University of Malaya is potentially minority groups within your own faculty or department. So I think a good example would be people who are not from UM, sometimes I think get under mentored in, in our university. I think the people who, you know, train at undergraduate in UM, masters in UM, and then work in UM, professor in UM, etc. They have this kind of like a natural mentoring thing where they already know the lecturers even before they join the department and they develop mentors kind of naturally. People who are outsiders within UM find it more difficult, I think. And I think these are the individuals you should be looking out for to provide mentoring, okay? This problem with mentoring also creates reduced diversity. I mean, it's no surprise that uh, universities, universities commonly have, so we're UM, right? So all our full profs are mostly people from UM. But it's the same worldwide as well. If you go to NUH, it's a very similar story as well. And I think a lot of this is because of this mentoring problem. So to try and work against this, I would uh, I would encourage people to seek out mentors and mentees actively and try and create structured programs within your department to mentor people, to not leave people out so much. Okay, these are my examples of some collaborative work that I've done in my from my department. The top one is work with uh, Singapore University and the bottom one is work with Curtin in Australia. Um, and I just wanted to say that we found it easier to reach out to NTU than it is to reach out to our own computer science department. I think this is through no fault of uh, the computer science department, certainly in, in UM. I think it's more about barriers that we've created amongst, amongst ourselves, you know. I think you only reach out to people you know. Once you've done a couple of papers with NTU, we can't help but go back to them every time we have a potential problem. I mean, this was an AI uh, paper, so every time we think about, you know, some AI thing, we think about NTU because we're familiar with them. And this goes back to my uh, suggestion that we kind of like need to get those relationships going internally, yeah? You kind of love what you know, if, if you like. And if we, I can't even name you a single computer scientist, it doesn't seem likely that I will, that'll be my go-to department if I had a problem, okay? So I'm hoping we can build relationships. And my hope is that in a year or two from now, I'll be able to show you papers with names of our own faculties that I've worked with. I think that would be nice. Okay, that's about it really. This is my summary. So if you want to level up and you want to do better and create impactful work, you got to collaborate, no choice, okay? Uh, I, I, my prayer, my, my hope is that uh, we can stop competing and start kind of working together. Just kind of build relationships, yeah? get to know everybody in, in the in the university and then try and work together from there. For yourself, get more central and try and create a little hub and then seek out people actively, okay? So I wanna, if ADEC doesn't mind, I wanna open invitation to anybody listening. If you think you wanna be proactive, you wanna present in my department, you're more than welcome to just write to me and I'll set it up, okay? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Prof. Rizal. No problem. So let me unshare and then, okay, over All to right. you, Amira. Okay, I can actually hear myself. Hold on, am I echoing? Okay, so here I am back again. Sorry, everybody, about this. I'm just trying to figure out why I was echoing. Let me just check this for a moment. Okay, not sure if I'm still echoing or not. Okay, Sound great. Okay. All right, great. Thank you so much. Well, Prof. Rizal, that was like an amazing presentation. Short, sweet, straight to the point, but so, so, so inspiring, I think, for me. Um, I have a host of questions that I want to ask you, but the first one is, can you share a little bit about your best collaboration experience? Like, you know, in your entire career, what was the one collaboration experience that, you know, still... That, that that like inspires all your other collaboration experiences um the one i really liked because it was so out there 
was something I did for uh, for a forensics um, journal. So like we have all these uh, we had all these bones, <laughs> we had all these CTs of of the wrist, the wrist, okay, scans of the wrist, and we didn't know what what to do with them. And then we worked with people in uh, forensic medicine and the and the lawyers. And we turned it into a forensic paper. So we made it seem as we, we we analyzed the data and we said that you can differentiate male from female by looking at the size of the wrist bone, something like that. So I really like that because it felt to me like totally unexpected. Like I, it's the only, I would never have thought I'd publish in like a, foren it's a forensic uh, journal, yeah? And I had to learn about things that I've never thought about before. Uh, and it's uh, that's the one I, I, I really like, and that really opened my eyes to the fact that you know you gotta you, you gotta look beyond your own little room sometimes, and you'd be surprised how valuable whatever data you have is to other people. The moment you start speaking to them, because we just showed them this stuff, and they were like, "That's amazing! We can do some," and we didn't know what to do with it for like for like years. We didn't know what to do with this data, and that really opened my eyes to um, how you gotta you gotta talk to people to try and figure stuff out. But I like that one. That was oh. a long time ago. So you're still remembering it. How did you end up actually showing um, these lawyers your your scans or your well, images? We started like chatting to the forensic medicine people. So these are pathologists. So they do postmortems, yeah. And they do postmortems for people that have been like murdered and stuff like that. Yeah. So they're forensic pathologists. And they oh, were the God. first ones to say, "I think it'd be interesting for this." And we were like, what? That's crazy. I don't think so. Because we're more used to like, you know, people who are alive, first of all. And secondly, when we're used to like a disease, not like crime and stuff, you know. Oh, wow. So, so that really opened up, um, I guess, a whole new world for you. Yeah, definitely. And that was through a conversation, I assume? Yes, it's just a conversation, yeah. So do you remember how it happened? That Did you like uh, happen to walk into the forensics um Department, yeah, sorry, it's not lawyer what I said just now, but did you just happen to walk into the medical forensics department where you're having tea with somebody from there? Yeah, it was just like over tea or coffee and they were just asking what kind of stuff we're working on, that kind of thing. And then like, we're, we're telling them, you know, we've got some stuff and we don't know what to do with these things. And all. But of course, that that's a success story, yeah, that one couple bone story. But of course, there are like, you know, 20 other things that ended up being dead ends as well. Uh, but that one certainly uh, went somewhere and it just it just started like that. It's just about when you have a, a dead end, just to, like someone asks you, so what kind of stuff are you working on? And so I've got this and I've got that. And then, yeah, I was just surprised how additive people's opinion can be and how, you know, you think you're like, you think you're like, so you contribute so much to your work. And like, I've worked so hard on this. No one else could add to this because I'm the best at whatever. <laughs> you know, who would know CT of the hand more than me, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you think you meet somebody and they just have a totally different, totally different angle. And it's, I think that's independent of hierarchy as well. I think if you become like, you know, a doctor or professor, you think that you like own this, this thing, <laughs> when actually you just need like a dif different set of eyes. So I guess that's where the meeting up, socializing, building relationships comes in, right? That yeah, yeah, that's right. And of course, over makan, as the pictures that you showed just now, that always happens over makan in Malaysia. <laughs> yes, certainly. Of which 99% of the time is nothing to do with work, of course. Okay, well, that will be a little bit challenging these days because we're still not yet meeting up for makan so much. But, you know, yeah, but we are meeting up here in forums like this one. So hopefully this might be sort of like a, a, an impetus for that. Um, oh, great. We have a question from Prof or Dr. Noor Diana. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Prof. Risa, thank you for Hi. the presentation. Hi, Amira. Um, I think this is our um, I think fifth, sixth meeting. So uh, thank you for organizing this. Um, I do actually I have lots of questions, um, uh, but I'll start with this. I come from a humanities background and I did my PhD in science and technology studies. And um, coming back to Malaysia, I realized it's really hard uh, to build, let alone sustain a relationship between the sciences and the humanities. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, what would be your advice to everyone here are probably trying to cross bridges uh, and and try not to burn them along the way. <laughs> uh, so 
Yeah, and second question, if you don't mind me asking, I'm sure this is a burning question for um, uh, especially young academics like uh, myself. Um, how do we continue to collaborate when, um, as we have um, discovered a few days ago, the KPI is not rewarding collaboration? Okay, so that's, a, that's my question. Okay. Thank you. So the first question is about this barrier between uh, social sciences or humanities and the sciences, is that right? Yeah, I think that's a very, very real uh, barrier. Is it, that's the biggest barrier, I think. I think it's easier for medics uh, to go to the uh, engineers or the, or the computer science people because we kind of deal with these things kind of part of what we do. The big hurdle is going to see a lawyer, social scientist, humanities, stuff like that is a little bit more of a jump. But my thinking personally is that uh, you need to focus on the co commonality, okay? So, for example, there's a lot about, I saw a paper about uh, linguistics. Linguistics and functional evaluation of the uh, larynx on, on MRI. And I thought that's pretty cool. Uh, I think that's the way to do it. But the only way you can, and I gotta admit, I haven't done much work with the humanities as well. The only way that can occur if you start to begin to listen to the kind of work that humanities do for me and for the people from humanities to start to listen to the work that we do because i think that commonality needs to be you need to look for it a little bit it's not just gonna appear out of nowhere so you need to go and uh, for whatever you do you need to go and and watch a talk or listen to a surgeon speaking or an engineer speaking and see how how that links to you but i also have to say that from our side, you kind of have to, I'm not going to use the word dumb it down, but you gotta, you got to slow it down a little bit and ensure it's for a general audience. Because I think there's a lot, for example, I've been to some engineering talks and it's just, I just feel like jumping out the window most of the time in an attempt to try and understand. So I think those talks must be uh, focused on building, building bridges. So if you were to attend uh, an ENT surgeon's talk uh, about the head and neck or the throat, they would have to explain the different things to you slowly. But I think that if I know academics, the moment you show interest in their thing, they get quite excited. Even though their thing you know, is obscure or whatever, they would love, I would love for people to just call me up and ask me what I thought was a really stupid bit of the world. <laughs> you know, the bones in the middle ear or whatever that I look at. If, if suddenly somebody from the opposite end of the university said, tell me more about these bones, what are they? I'd be like really interested because most of the time nobody knocks on, on my door except to pass behind me to get coffee. Uh, so I think, I think it's about that, to find the common ground, but you need to actively look for it, I, I think. And there is certainly is common ground, but it's difficult. I agree with you, it is difficult. The second question was about... Um, was about collaboration and how you feel the pointer system doesn't really encourage it. Is that right? After I, mean, I don't really, I, I didn't, I didn't attend those talks by the TNCs. Um, so I don't really know the new pointer system, but I, I have an idea that they, they don't want you to have work within the university. Is that right? They, they encourage work international uh, collaboration. Is, is that right? Something like that? Uh, and also that if um, for single author they have more points than say an article with uh, two authors, three authors, then they will reduce the points uh, for yeah, uh, and, more authors. In yeah, and I appreciate that because of redundancy. So they want to create unique uh, papers. They want to create unique articles. Uh, I can understand that. And honestly, if I was sitting where they sit, I would do the same. I would say we, we need unique articles. We can't have one, uh, one article, you know, with the whole department on it and pretend we've published 300 articles, something like that. that so I think that's a fair solution. Uh, I think it does discourage us from collaborating uh, a little bit, but I still think there's value in collaborating because I think you should aim to get volume. <laughs> so I understand that I don't think it's, I don't think it's discouraging collaboration. By all means, you know, collaborate as much as you like. But I think they're, they're, they're drawing a limit to collaboration. Once you have five, six, seven, eight people from the same department, it begins to you're diminishing returns for that paper, right? But I would say that the real, I mean, the real value collaborations that, that we can do if you really do this properly, uh, if I were to collaborate with the three of you, inshallah, we can have three papers, so it shouldn't be a, 
shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. So you should aim, forget the KPIs for a second and just aim to, to solve problems and learn from each other and open our eyes and ears to the different disciplines. So I don't think it discourages it completely. I think it encourages us to create unique articles. I think that's what the TNCs were trying to achieve. Maybe I'm being diplomatic. Right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Thanks, Dr. Diana, for the questions. Uh, very important questions. Actually, those are the same questions that that I had as well. And um, Prof. Rizal, thank you for you know being diplomatic. I think that that kind of helps at a time of high emotion. Um, I think a lot of us are very worried about the 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 new way of of scoring the KPIs. And I guess having a different perspective on it, looking at it from a different perspective that, you know, uh, of course, if I write a paper now, uh, my paper is, you know, if I collaborate with somebody else, then I'm going to get less points for that paper. But then again, you raised a good point, which, um, you know, to be completely honest, I didn't see it this morning until you actually raised it that, yeah, maybe if I collaborate with, you know, two or three other authors, perhaps then I have to split um, my points with two or three other authors. But that also means that I can write another three or four papers with the same authors and perhaps with, you know, more more hits um, better than one, uh, we could come up with more ideas. Uh, but having said that, you know, just I do understand um, and I'm feeling it as well, the apprehension and the worry about whether or not we're going to be able to to meet our minimum KPI um, this year. So we'll see how that goes. But definitely, I think at a time of of intense worry at a time of um, uncertainties. Perhaps as you were saying earlier, uh, Prof. Rizal, building relationships would be very important if for nothing else to at least make us feel that, you know, someone else is also in the same boat and perhaps we can work together and try and, and, and collaborate so that we can somehow or the other get some KPI points or get some of our KPIs um, underway through collaboration, even if it does mean that we have to uh, Sort of like share those points. Um, sorry, I'm going. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting a little bit too talkative right now. So I've got uh, other questions as well for for Prof. Rizal. Um, now I, w I asked you just now about you know your your best collaboration experience. Uh, can you share about your best co-authorship experience? What it's like to actually co-author with others? Was it on that same paper? Was it on a different paper? A paper that you had to collaborate with others? Um, maybe not as first author or maybe as corresponding author? I don't know. Well, as uh, I mean, I'll share with you, I'll just share with you guys as a junior when I was much, well, maybe 10 years ago when I first started, the most daunting thing was to collaborate with um, very, um, very well-known um, authors. <laughs> so, uh, but I think it's good and I think you should aim aim for that because they really contribute a lot and you really have to step up. And I would say looking back, there's almost embarrassing. And I think that some of those prominent authors uh, carried uh, me and, and our little team a little bit. And I think that uh, that that's the that's the experience that I'm kind of embarrassed about. <laughs> but I would recommend it for for junior academics. You know, aim high, don't be embarrassed, go for it. Because I think a lot of these uh, very senior, very established authors, they want to help you as well, and you can learn a, a lot from them. And in the beginning, you feel very embarrassed, and you're like, oh no, my contribution is so little, and you know, I, I, and like they're correcting my grammar repeatedly, whatever. And, you know, and these are like international universities, you know, and so it's, I feel embarrassed for UM or whatever. But looking back, I think it's good. And I think as a junior academic, you should aim for that because you would want to level up. You want to be as good as they are. And I think it sets a benchmark very, very early. Like this is how you work on, on projects, you know, and however embarrassing it was back, back then. Uh, I, I would say that that's kind of a good interaction. That, I think, relates very much to mentorship as well, in a way, right? Because these other more established authors at the time were probably um, acting in a way as, as, as your yeah. writing mentor, mentors um, or your publication mentors. So my next question, um, you know, is about mentorship again within this new environment that we're finding ourselves in, in UM. 
mentorship, as you said, you know, sometimes it happens organically. Sometimes you actually have to sort of like structure it. But how do we then now get people to want to be mentors, people who can mentor others now? And I think it's not just like professors or associate professors, even juniors, um, you know, can can do peer mentoring. We can peer mentor our, our, our colleagues and our colleagues can kind of like peer, men, peer mentor us um, in areas that maybe they're more expert in and we're not. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure whether or not there are points for mentorship. And how do we now encourage people to, to be willing to contribute your time to mentor somebody else, um, to be willing to open up your expertise, but most, most of all, to contribute your very limited time to build that relationship and mentor somebody else. Yeah, I think mentoring is very, uh, it's very kind of intimate, you know, it's almost like, you know, paternal maternal kind of re relationship where you almost give and you don't get anything back. Sometimes I think men mentors are like that, at least the ones that have people that acted as my mentors, I certainly would not be able to repay them, you know, they are people who are already extremely established and whatever I, I can't do anything in return for them. So I think a lot there's this there's this uh, to, to really mentor people, you need to have this like uh, you almost sacrifice your, your time and effort into the development of this person. And you need to be happy that this person at some point in their lives potentially will surpass you as well. They get better at whatever it is you do. I mean, if you're a good mentor, your students and your mentees will be better at, at whatever you do very quickly. And that's a good thing. And I think it's very difficult to quantify or turn into a, a KPI. I think that's what you're asking, is that right? How do we incentivize this? Um, well, yes, it would be great if we could incentivize it. But, you know, beyond incentives, how do we get people to be willing to want to mentor others despite the fact that there are no incentives for it? It's difficult. I don't really know how to do that. Um, I think that I think really good mentors. There's this element of sincerity that I don't. I don't think uh, any incentive would work for the mentors that I, the ones that really function as mentors to me. I don't think any incentive would have changed what what they did. I think what they wanted to do was to make things better for their own discipline, their own specialty, their own department, and they saw mentoring me as a conduit to that. And that's pretty much the initial. But I know that sounds a little bit hippie and a little bit message of hope. But uh, that's my honest answer about how I think my mentors treated me and what I can hope for people who want to take on uh, men mentees. But I also see a point about having clearer structure. OK, so one thing that we can do is to create very clear structure to mentorship programs. So create goals and timelines and things that hippie mentors would have done instinctively, naturally. But non-hippie mentors may need some, you know, tick boxes or whatever to say that, you know, uh, love your student tick box. And then uh, after that, you know, say you're doing well, another tick box, something like that. So I think that may increase the access of mentors. And I think there's some, there's value to, to that as well, creating structure and then telling people, look, this is what you got to do. So on Tuesday, you got to tell your mentor, you know, good job, tick, something like that. I think that's beautiful. I don't think it's hippie. I think that's actually um, a really great way of getting people to, you know, at least if not see points, but then you do sort of like, you have this, I guess, um, feel good kind of factor. And that's actually very useful um, in our work because when we feel good, we feel better, we tend to be more productive and we actually perform better. I know that there's some scientific work on that. I can't cite any at the moment. So perhaps mentorship can actually help us as well in a way to, to perform better because we feel good when we help others. Um, okay, uh, so yes, can, sorry. I, can I say something, Amira? Malia? Yes, yes, please go okay, ahead. Okay, uh, I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> listening to an interesting conversation. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, what is needed is the, the culture of uh, mentoring. Uh, this is important, like for UM, we really need, uh, there is some culture but we need to develop that further so that the whole community the um community one uh, gearing towards this culture of uh, mutual mentoring and note that we have our 
core values, points. The first one is passion. So we need that uh, passion within all of us in the community uh, to help one another to build up this culture. And this is the way now uh, to achieve our new vision, right? The global unity which uh, impacting the world. So let's do it. And uh, it's good Dr. Raja Rizal and the others are very enthusiastic about that. And so uh, I think Amira and others as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof Ng, for weighing in. And thank you so much for joining our webinar as well. It's always such an honor whenever we have professors also joining, um, you know, esteemed professors also joining the ADEC webinar. Thanks so much for sharing about that. And um, yeah, Prof Rizal, would you would you like to, to respond to expand on, uh, on that or any comments before I go on with mine? Yeah, I think what Prof Ng said about this kind of culture of mentoring is kind of the way to do it. And I think once the very senior people do it kind of organically and naturally, the more junior members of faculty will also want to do it more often, you know, that everybody just does it, everybody just mentors each other constantly. And I think that will, you know, create this atmosphere that everybody's working for everybody else. Everybody's kind of a stakeholder to everyone else's success. That, that's kind of like uh, the feel of mentoring. Anyway. Yeah, and I think, um the culture will probably help that. That's probably the most important thing is to start creating the culture by modeling it. Maybe we can sort of like, you know, we do mentorship and perhaps that might infect others to also start doing that. And perhaps that might lead to a culture of mentorship and collaboration. So hope, really, really hoping that poise will actually happen um, in the UM culture and, and, and hope that you know, people will, will try and, and live up to that. Um, so before we uh, go on any further, I've got a question here and Prabhupada, this is actually from a postgrad student. So very happy to have postgrad students here as well from Ms. Umina Bila. So Ms. Umina Bila is um, saying, I always, as a postgrad student, I always feel like before reaching out to my supervisors and other collaborators, I need to have a clear idea of where I'm stuck and what help do I need. So when contacting them, the problems should be made clear to them so that they can help. But more often than not, I only know I'm in trouble and only have a vague idea of what the problem is. So it's hard to reach out for help when you don't even know what help to ask for. So Prof. Rizal, what's your advice? I think your supervisors need to be possibly more empathic and understand that sometimes it's very difficult to just identify the exact problem. So uh, I think I, I would be happy to be presented with a more a vague problem as well. Uh, I'm not saying it's ideal. I would pretty much prefer a very specific problem for me to fix, you know, like one sentence. What's, what's the best place to put the comma here? I think that's fine. But I think... Uh, the more senior you are, you should be very happy to deal with more. I mean, when you say vague, Umi, you really mean it's a complex problem, okay? So vague is kind of a negative, it's a very negative um, spin on it. I think it just means that it's more complex. It's not so easy to digest and to untangle. And I think that's what you need senior people for, to untangle complex problems, yeah? Uh, but also be forgiving. Sometimes senior people don't know the answers all, all the time. Uh, but I think your supervisor should be able to deal with complex problems. Um, yeah. Thanks, Prof. Rizal. And, um, you know, just mentioning about what the supervisor should be able to do. Uh, in the spirit now of, of, of mentorship and supervisors as default, uh, de facto mentors, how how would you, oh, maybe you can share with us, how do you supervise your students? How do you mentor them? I don't think I do a terribly good job. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is? So I think like supervising and mentoring is like two, kind of two different things. I think supervise, supervisory role is very narrow. I think you have a very clear goal. And of course, you're a mentor for that given project. So let's say you're a supervisor for a given, uh, to write a paper or to finish a course or something like that. I think the goal is quite, quite clear. Whereas mentoring is more um, wishy-washy is not a great word, but more kind of like uh, subjective. You may be interested in general career progression. You may also be interested in mental state, mental health. You may also be interested in imparting ethical solutions to problems, things like that. 
that a more narrow supervisory role for a master's project may not really may not really entail. You know, once the project is over, that that's that's about it. I think mentors have a, should have a more holistic um, role to the person's contribution to not only the department and the job, but also maybe community, to the university, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Supervisors are more narrow. Okay, your question was how do I supervise? Is that right? <laughs> so I largely am led by like the the student. So I address problems as they come. I don't really draw large macro plans for my students or their projects. I kind of like it. So I like students that are very proactive and come to conclusions themselves. And I review some of these things. But I'm also happy to draw larger plans to students who don't really want to deal with those things and help them along. So it really is led by the, the students uh, most of the time, how much they want me to be uh, to to intervene, how much uh, they would they want me to guide them, or a more uh, laid back approach. You know, I can solve problems as they come along. It's different from student to student as well. Some respond to, to different things. I wouldn't say it's just one one size fits all for supervisory rule. Oh, that's really great for results. I think my students may disagree with all this. We'll have to ask them later on after this. Um, but as, as another supervisor speaking to a supervisor too, that's also how I supervise my students. So so yeah, so nice to know that I'm not the only one. Um, we've got another question now also from another postgrad student. Um, so this is from Ms. Ravi. Uh, how, I'm a postgrad student. How do you re-strategize your paper when it gets rejected a few times? Please share your experience and some helpful tips. <laughs> so this is like, this is like, something we're very good at, okay? <laughs> we're very good at being rejected, that's certainly true. So uh, so my usual strategy with papers is to um, aim high in the beginning, okay? So go, go for big, big, uh, really prominent journals, etc. because the ones that we send to usually, are, are they provide lots and lots, they reply quickly, first of all, and they provide lots and lots of feedback to your paper as well, okay? Um, if you have multiple rejections, even after all this feedback, after you've gone down the different tiers that are available to you, and you need to kind of rethink about the, the narrative, uh, if it's a very large project, I would focus on an area of the project. Maybe you can focus narrative on, on that instead, will be what we commonly do. Because sometimes the project can be very, very large, and to draw a very clear narrative from the entire project can be very challenging. It may be difficult to sell to a lot of journals that are very specialized as well. They may only want to look at the valves in the heart, whatever. Whereas yours is, is just kind of a generic paper looking at high blood pressure or something like that. So you may want to change your narrative and suit that to specific journals. Um, so that's how we kind of deal with, with our papers when we re-strategize. We also try and change the, um, the areas of interest sometimes. So we're very lucky that we can sell it to you know radiology journals, potentially general medical journals as well, and before forensic journals as well. So similar, it's the same data, it's the same uh, research paper, but we change the narrative to suit the audience, if you like. So that's kind of how we change the narrative. Sometimes if we're very un if we're unsuccessful, repeated times. Does that answer the question? Who asked the question? Is it Ravi, is it? Yes, it's it's from Ravi. I hope it does. Uh, okay, great. She said thank you, Prof. So hopefully that that did answer the question for her. Um, definitely for me, I think that was a very useful advice as well for not just postgrad students, but for lecturers um, lecturers too. So. Okay, I didn't hear you. You're muted. Ah, sorry about that. Okay. Thank, thank you for letting me know. Uh, so thank you, Prof, for answering uh, Ravi's question. She says thank you there. So I think that helped to answer her question. And at the same time, I think it was also good advice for the rest of us, including um, lecturers and researchers, all of us trying to publish and being pretty good at getting rejected. We are close um, to the end of our webinar today. So before we close off, Prof Rizal, can I get final parting advice from you on collaboration and mentorship. Yeah, Pro Prof Ng said it just now, I think. So I like that passion and relationships. Does that sound disgusting or what? <laughs> so I first, love it. So the first P in the, in the poise that the VC presented a few months ago. So just this, this combination of passion and relationships, you know, so try and focus on what you really enjoy about doing whatever it is you do. 
and to try and inspire others to join you in doing whatever you want to do and then build relationships based on that really and find commonality between different disciplines that's it really thanks very much everyone Great summary, Perf Rizal. Thank you so much, Perf Rizal. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, do remember to fill up our feedback form, and you can also rewatch this on YouTube and on ADEX, um, ADEX website later on. So thanks again, Perf Rizal. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thank See you guys soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.